the Arabs become truly independent, they will they will be in charge of their oil, and and all this richness that the corporations are making, and the and the the military industry uh, uh, corporations are making, which are based on the cheap oil that they're getting, and all the bases that they have in the world, will end up. Uh, without any way of supporting them. So, uh, five minutes. So, uh, with that, I will end. And uh, I know that it looks uh, it looks like a big challenge, but I feel that the Americans are really scared. You know, they know that they can uh, they can maybe maintain their uh, their power, but they are having problems. They have 150,000, they have 98,000 soldiers, they say, in Afghanistan, 50,000 in Iraq, they have 50,000 contractors who are actually veterans who are uh, working there. So you, you have all these armies outside. How many, how many more armies can they send? Even in the case of Libya, people were complaining, you know, why are we, why is America getting involved in Libya? Because oil, the oil from Libya does not come to the United States, but uh, but NATO NATO would wanted to control the oil in Libya, and the Americans are really the main are the core of NATO. Without the Americans, NATO would not exist. So so the American people were very aware. Even people like Republicans, conservative people, were saying, "Why should we get involved in Libya? We have enough." We have enough costs, you know, we have problems, we have deficits. So can they start another war in Syria? Can they, can they maintain another war in Syria? Can they maintain another one in, uh, uh, I don't know where, it could start, you know, it could start anywhere. So, so they have a problem because there's 22 Arab countries and uh, 11 of them where they have their bases and they have to maintain those bases. But, but in the long run, I am confident that the, the Arab youth have lost their fear of the rulers, and they have lost the fear of death. And they feel that you cannot live as a human being without dignity. See, Arabs within their country don't have dignity because their rulers are oppressing them. And outside of their country, when they go outside, people look down on Arabs and say, oh, these Arab dictators, these Arab, uh, you know, uh, the bad images about uh, Arab men, uh, you know, uh, all these kings and princes. Uh, and uh, in the case of Syria, it, there is one exception, because Arabs in Syria are feel, you know, with no pride. But outside, they feel proud because their government is challenging the US empire. So there is 50-50 balance there. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but most Arabs feel that, you know, they cannot tolerate this, and the youth who are growing in numbers with no jobs have nothing to lose. So, uh, so the future belongs to the people. Thank you very much. Well, like many of you, this um, Sunday and Monday I sat transfixed by the videos of the young Palestinians winding through the hills of the Golan Heights toward the barren strip of dirt and barbed wire that made up the border with Israel. Um, the video I was looking at was uh, not professionally edited and it seemed as though the image was flowing in slow motion and that sensation contributed to this feeling of inexorable progress or the inevitability um, of their mission. Until they reached the fence and the fragility of the group and the relatively small numbers of those tumbling over the spiked wire, the camera view showing um, only one or two embraces from the residents of the Druze village on the border, um, uh, the fragility of the project struck home. But the reaction of Net Netanyahu was murderous beyond reason, mm -hmm. and the tone of his pronouncements even more apocalyptic than usual. And of course, Sunday's streams of youth permeating the borders of Israel from many sides are combined in the common imagination with the steaming forward of the martyrdom of the Rachel Corey, the pending launch of the audacity of hope, the unrelenting stream of political actions that are going to occur after that and after that. 
because our confidence and Netanyahu's palpable fear are born of the Arab Spring, the courage of Mohammed Bouazizi, the combativeness of the masses who fought off the paramilitaries in Tahrir Square, and the other seemingly um, slow, and, and we, in our mind's eye, we have these images, this other seemingly slow motion, Eisenstein-like scene of the masses ebbing and flowing around the murderers trying to run them down, and then finally pushing the hated Egyptian security forces back across the Cairo Bridge. Now we all know there's nothing inevitable on the horizon, but although nothing is surely decided in the struggle for self-determination and working class power in the Middle East and North Africa, after years of retreat and defeat, we see the masses of Tunisia and Egypt and other countries taking the stage, paying attention to the lines of a most famous script, and in the case of Egypt, the most powerful country in the Middle East, with the, and with the most powerful and combative working class in the lead. So as my co-panelists said, we're privileged to be living through a grand and sweeping transnational revolutionary moment, and no matter what the outcome, the world is never going to be the same. Revolutionary socialists of all stripes note that the sheer numbers of participants and the sheer number of countries affected make this um, an incredible moment. Perry Anderson calls it a rare class of historical event, a chain of political explosions, one detonating the another, across an entire region of the world. It's like nothing we've experienced, he says, save the 15-year stretch of the Hispanic American Wars of Liberation, the European revolutions of 1848 to 49, and the fall of the regimes in the Soviet bloc from 1989 to 91. In this case, however, the revival of the Arab Revolution that was deflected by the dead end of Nasserism and Baathism is shaking a region where formal decolonization has been followed by a nearly uninterrupted sequence of imperial wars and interventions. And despite the limited character of the victories in Tunisia and Egypt, where dictators, but not regimes or the bourgeoisie, were overthrown, and where pro-U.S. capitalist classes continue to hold the reins of power, revolution is back on the scene as a realistic solution for the world's popular classes. Um, or as another British Marxist said, revolution in the classical mode, popular mobilizations, divisions at the top, battles for the troops, struggles over the political and social character of a new regime, potentially more radical movements from below, all this is now a 21st century reality. That's why today Barack Obama, who uh, says he supports democracy, but in fact announced the means by which the U.S. ruling class hopes to halt this revolutionary wave, address the nation and the world. He got on TV today to announce that he's assembling his team, that uh, among the Egyptian elites, and the liberal um, and forces in the liberal middle class, he announced that he'll rate, he will eliminate um, 1.5 billion of the Egyptian debt load, and contribute, I believe, another billion toward aid for to a fund for new business uh, and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial enterprises that theoretically new jobs uh, for the youth of Egypt. The U.S. has now decided to employ the very, very large carrot, along with a very, very large stick that they've been employing to the region so far. Now, what is it uh, that pushed, and, and to hear um, Obama say it today, um, their intervention in Egypt was something new. Uh, and we'll examine that a little bit and talk about what pushed the Egyptian masses to take this extraordinary road. What is the overarching context? Um, of course, just like the strikes and demonstrations in Europe, this, res this was a response first and foremost in some it to the capitalist economic crisis that's hitting the world over. And the manner in which the Egyptian regime tried to turn the screws one more, one more turn to make the uh, masses bear the cost of their resulting losses from this newest crisis. Um, imagining a response to these new attacks, Mubarak had upped the arbitrariness of police victimization, arrest, and torture, moving from hard political targets to those he had sheltered in the past. 
Most interesting is the fact that Tunisia and Egypt, the sites of the most advanced um, revolutionary activity, were considered the poster child children for the IMF and World Bank's neoliberal programs for the Middle East. In 2010, the World Bank singled them both out. Egypt, of course, was the pioneer for the structural adjustment in the entire global <coughs> south, with Sadat announcing the, the opening of the economy as early as 1974. Mubarak made his first major contribution by overturning the tenant rights for agricultural land that had been given to the free officers in 1952 and allowing the old landlords and their heirs to return and dispossess peasant households. He also agreed to sell state-owned industries and in return he, re he received a guarantee from the Paris Club for 30 billion pounds. These were just the major reforms that have been carried out in the 90s reforms. Um, and with others, uh, Mubarak ripped the Nasserah social contract to shreds, leading to a 26 percent, that's the modest estimate, unemployment rate, perhaps three times as large among the youth 15 to 29 years old, and a situation where 44 percent of Egyptians live below the international poverty rate of two dollars a day. On top of this, in the period right before the rebellion, food prices had tripled for many commodities. Meanwhile, the local beneficiaries of economic reform and structural adjustment, who received enormous kickbacks for selling off the state companies and the land cheap, were living ostentatiously, building massive villas on the desert fringe with names like Dreamland and Utopia um, for all to see. Um, on top of this situation, then came the 2008 crash with declines in GDP, um, remittances uh, from, em from Egyptian emigrants, tourism, revenues from the Suez Canal all fell dramatically. Anticipating trouble, Mubarak stepped up the repression and made everyone fair game for police harassment and arrest. Um, they had such confidence in their repressive measures that for the 2000 election, they didn't even bother to prevent the filming of their stuffing of the ballot boxes and the shredding of ballots um, and all the, for all the world to see. Now this same period saw the development of new forms of collective protest in Egypt. What was our side doing? Activists recall, and, and as they recount the narrative of what led to Tahrir Square, um, claiming ever and ever larger circles of political space. Some of this began with protests in support of the Second Palestinian Intifada. In 2003, they held a massive protest in Cairo. They called it the Tahrir Intifada uh, against the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And many activists saw this as kind of a dress rehearsal for 2011. Um, that confidence <coughs> in those victories led youth and others organi to organize small rallies, lobbies, ma marches, and flash mobs for democratic change, uh, things that were organized by email and social networking. Um, and because it was a new kind of organizing, they had some space, the cops were caught off guard, a head of steam was built up. At the same time, there were concurrent and dramatic struggles going on in the workplaces of Egypt, um, and they were growing by the day, giving all these youthful protesters and, uh, from other classes confidence. In 2005, there were 202 collective work actions. In 2006, 222. In 2007, 614, and of course that one included the most important and sustained strike and victorious mass action at the Mahala al Kubra textile mill. Because they won key concessions there, they inspired even more workers, and so on and so on. The strike wave with Mahala at its center has been described by one historian as the largest social movement in Egypt for over half a century, with 1.2 million workers and their families engaged in some kind of protest. The regime did not attack the strikers um, directly, hoping that things would die out. Instead, demonstrations um, on a large number of issues began to take place. Demos, dem demonstrations around the shortages of bread and water, student protests against land seizures around housing, and against police brutality. By the time that the Tunisians drove out Ben Ali, the Egyptian masses were ready. They had